I was invited about three weeks ago to K PJ, to PJ uh, and uh, Cheras. Young working people, how God provide for them. So I say, so we went. And uh, the number one factor to this afternoon, as we are talking about finance, I want to establish in you and in me that God is always the owner. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, if you got a Bible, just turn to 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, 20. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. Beloved, I need you to understand this very truth itself. So when you know this truth, it doesn't matter what is happening out there. Because you understand that God is the owner. We are only a steward. We are only a manager. That what God, when you know that, you will not be affected by whatever circumstances out there, situations out there. For you know that God is your provider. God will always be your provider. So it doesn't matter what situations. Amen? He says this, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who is from God? And you are born at a price. When Jesus died on the cross, he bought you and myself. He has given his body. He lives inside you. So we know for this that God is always the owner. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 8 verse 18 says this, that God is the one that gives you the power to get wealth so that the covenant of the fathers will be fulfilled in your life. So again, it's been established that God is the one that gives you the power to get wealth until today. You know, so that the covenant of the fathers, that you can share with anybody, everybody, that God is still blessing you through the fathers of Abraham. That why Abraham has blessed you Continue to follow. One of the very simple messages in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, 14, it said, We have been redeemed from every curse by the blood of Jesus, that the blessings of Abraham come upon you. So it's interesting. Not only you receive the blessing from Jesus, you also receive the blessing from Abraham. A double portion, in a way, from Abraham's line, and then you are in Christ, seeds of Abraham in Galatians 3 verse 29, and you are heirs of the promise of God. So it's important that you must surely know that God is your owner. You know, and if you follow his ways, right? So I share with the Kuala Lumpur, the Chiras group, I said there are four ways you need to do it when you know God is the owner. Amen? Amen. It's not us, we can work and God is the one who also gives us, I often say to many people, if God doesn't bring patient to my clinic as a dentist, I live on fresh air and sunshine. <laughs> you know what I mean? I can't bring patients in, but God is the one. He brings patients in. So I have to continue to reckon myself that God is your provider. Now, it doesn't matter what you do. So number one, when you know that God has stipulated in the Bible, there are four things you and I have to do. Number one is tithing. I know that a lot of people say all sorts of things from the YouTube or from these things that no need to tithe. Tithe was the, in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament. Not in, tithe was the law, but it's not true. Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek before the law. Jacob did the same thing, gave tithes. In fact, I wouldn't even use the word gave because we cannot give something that does not belong to us. We can only return. You and I can only return the 10%, the tithe. And it's so important. Uh, I think David may have heard one of my sessions in Pastor Blessings Church. I was invited to speak in Sandakan, in the interior, 
in the interior of Santa Cruz with the Cardazans, the natives of Cardazans. They invited me for three nights for a revival meeting. So I brought a doctor friend with me into the so-called interior, like a jungle like that. There was no electricity. They all worked by a generator in the evening. So daytime is really hot. So I brought a doctor to protect me. <laughs> you know, mosquitoes are everywhere. You know, there was no fan, nothing. So you cannot operate anything, no electricity, only at night. And, uh, and we have to live by the riverside. You know, the people live by the riverside. They wash, you know, their food, their rice up in the upper stream. They wash their clothes in the downstream. So they wash all their food first up there. So it was like that. So the first night came, there was an interior, there was a hall in the interior. Can sit about 500 people. I don't think it's an exaggeration, but it's a huge hall inside the interior. And it was packed, it was filled with kadazans. It was overflowed with kadazans. They came for the meeting. So the first night, I have to ask the Lord, as I shared in the beginning, we have to ask the Lord. Even though it was a revival meeting, I have to ask the Lord, what do you want me to share to the Cardassians? And the Lord said this to me, I want you to teach them on tithes and offerings. So I thought to myself, oh dear, is this a revival meeting? <laughs> you know? So within my own mind, I was struggling, but I, I have to obey God. Can you say amen? I have to obey God. So I came out and shared very, in a simple terms. I shared with the blessed Cardassians. I said, you make one dollar, give 10 cents, return 10 cents as a tithe unto the Lord. 10%, 10 cents. And I arbitrarily say you give five more sen as an offering, right? A lot of people come to the church and say, I, I did bring my tithe, but I'm not blessed. So I, I, if you ever talk to me, I will tell them, you have not given anything yet. You have only returned the 10% to God, but you have not given. The offering is the one that multiplies back to you. It's the offering that multiplies to you, and the offering got no percentage. Offering is from your heart. I often say, I cannot say to my wife, I love you 25% only. <laughs> I love her with all my heart. Right? When we love God, there's no percentage. It's from your heart towards God. Even with the, the widow that gave two mites, that's all that she has. That's why the Lord said, look at her. You know, and she was giving her best, her best unto God. So tithing is returning. But what happens in tithing? Few things are so important when you return the tithes. Number one, God said, I open heaven for you. In Malachi chapter 3. You see, in Leviticus 27, verse 30 says, all tithes belongs to God. Very clearly stated in the Bible. All tithes belongs to God. Number two, all tithes are holy unto God. And that's why correspondingly in the book of Malachi, the people along the journey of the history of Israel, they have taken the tithe, they never give tithe properly, they, all sorts of things. And that's why in the book of Malachi, God came back to address the issue because Leviticus 27 verse 30 says, all tithes belongs to God. So when you take the tithes and put it in your bank account, I often say to them, you are putting a bomb in your bank account. Anything that you take from God becomes that explosive. I got a good friend here in Malacca many years ago, and uh, he always comes to my clinic, and he always complained before he was on the verge of becoming a Christian, or a new Christian. He was in the real estate. He said, why? Everywhere I put my money, somebody took it. Everywhere, people know how to take his money. So I said, do you return your tithing? No, 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 because he was probably just on the verge of coming into the kingdom of God. He said, I even hide it inside the closet, you know, in the car, in the box. Somebody will know how to take it. <laughs> it's a devourer. Take it away. So later, he thought, he was so fed up is the word. He said, I bought a new car, and every time people will bang his car, you know, and he has to pay. So he decided to buy a new car, Somebody will come and bang his car again. So 
after the dice, after the he accepted, learned the tithing, nothing anymore. Come to take his money. So it's important when you return the tithing, God says to you in Malachi, you rob me. Why rob me? Because in Leviticus 27, 30, tithes belongs to him. So when you take that money, we rob God. Number two, when you take that money, we bring ourselves a curse. So it's correspondingly correct in the book of Malachi. So number three, God said, when you return tithing, I will open heaven for you. Open heaven is a very important statement. Whether, when God opened heaven for you, the favor of God is upon you. Amen? The favor of God is upon you. I shared this morning about the pastor, you know, wanting to buy uh, 10 acres of land, and the Taiwanese businessman also want to buy the same piece of land, but the owner, Taiwanese say, I will give you cash, say to the owner. Pastor say, I have to pay you certain months, certain months. He doesn't have all the cash. And the owner still gave that piece of land to the pastor. He didn't sell it to the Taiwanese. Not only that, he decided to give an extra five acres to the pastor. This is called favor. Lah. You know, favor of God that, you know, even though he doesn't have the money, but the favor of God was for him. So number one, God said, I will open heaven for you. When God opened heaven for you, means that he trusts you. I think one of the things for you and myself is that we need to be trusted by God. When God trusts you, there is no problem of finance. There is no problem of any other thing. So, so when God says you bring in the tithe, I trust you. I will open heaven for you. That's important. You know, I often say if God cannot trust us for 10%, how can God trust us for millions of dollars? By the time millions of dollars come, you find that it's so difficult to give. You cannot give 100 or 1,000 to God. Then when God comes to 10,000, 100,000, going to the millions bracket, it's impossible. You will never dare to do it. So that's why God begins with that 10%. And it's better than income tax in Malaysia. Only 10%. God only asks 10% from you. And when you return the 10% unto God, He says He trusts you. He will open heaven for you. Right? And that is the beginning, the favor of God upon your life. So tithing speaks a lot of important lessons for us. It's not our money. We cannot keep it. I often advise Christians, you cannot take the tithe. You have to return it to the storehouse, to the church. That belongs to God. You cannot take it. See. It's not ours. See. That's why I say we, you can only return the tithes back to God. Amen? Amen? Number two is the... So when you return the tithes unto God, God says, I will rebuild the devourer from you. So nobody can take your money. God also says, I will protect your finance. Finally, if you want to bless Malaysia, I say to the churches, if you want Malaysia to be blessed, you need to return your tithing back to God. Because God say, when you return the tithes back to God, He will cover the nation. So a lot of Christians, sometimes we forget that. That the way to bless the nation is you and I have to be faithful to God to do what God asks us to do. Amen? So number one is tithing. Number two, I was saying to the young adults out there, I said, number two is offering. Right? It is the offering that God multiplies your seed. Right? There are many ways to it. The Bible says when you sow the offering, 34, 64, 100 fold, or 1,000 fold. In Deuteronomy 1, verse 11, say about 1,000 fold come back to you. You never can sow less to God. I got a very good friend, a, lawyer, a doctor here, has gone back to the Lord. Very well known doctor in Malaysia, uh, in Malacca. Very good friend of mine, very good Christian. Every time I come back from Australia, he will invite me for dinner in his home. One particular time, he says to me, 
Chujay, he called me Chujay, my name. Chujay, my accountant said to me, you are in the red and you keep on giving to God. <laughs> the accountant is not Christian. And they cannot fathom why this doctor keep on giving to God, yet he was in the red, means he, he's still owing. So he asked me, what do you think? So I said to him, so and so, I believe you need to keep on going. Your tithes and offering, even though you are taking from the banks, you know, because he's owing, he's taking from the banks. I began to share with him a principle that is so important in the Bible. Now, if you owe the bank money, it's very difficult for you to pay back because the interest keep on coming, keep on mounting, keep on multiplying. So I said, the only way you can get rid of your debts cycle, put it this cycle you owe in. Uh, you have to create a new cycle. When you create a new cycle by sowing and reaping, every time you reap is bigger than your sowing. Every time you sow, God says, I bless you 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold, 1,000 fold. So when God bless you more, you don't eat it up. Lah. All right? You put it back to continue to sow. And soon later, that blessings that come from God clear up all your debts. Okay. Debt funds come, clear up the, the debt. Next year, I came back again to Malacca, invited me for dinner again. And this doctor, when he saw me, he was beaming, laughing. Chuje, my accountant said, first time you are in the black. <laughs> it means you don't owe money anymore, you are in the black. That's what he did. He started sowing, reaping, sowing, reaping. He keep on going. Keep on multiplying, multiply, multiply until that comes back more than the debt. And that overtake it. I was in Singapore speaking to a, a prudential insurance with all the staff there. When I finished, I came out with my wife and uh, there was a young lady standing out there. When I went near her, she was crying. She cried. So I came to, to her and said, why are you crying? He said, I got no money to buy lunch. I, I, this is in Singapore. I got a shock on my life. She said, I got no, she dressed up beautifully. She said, I got no money to buy lunch. I said, how come? He said, I owe so much money. So I taught her the same cycle. I said, you, you cannot get out of your debt cycle. You have to start now sowing and reaping another cycle to overtake your old cycle. You know, when I bought my, my family home, my wife said to me, ah, yeah, the boys get taller and taller, which is true. They're all six-footers. Nearly every one of them are six-footers. I probably can't become the shortest in the family. <laughs> So my wife said, oh, yeah, we need to go and look for a home. We live in a wooden, half brick, half wooden home. They call it the high set home. The kitchen is upstairs. So, so my wife said, we have to follow. My wife is a very quiet lady, you know, like Debbie. <laughs> so she was a very quiet lady. She's a very good doctor. So she doesn't speak a lot. But when my wife speaks, I have to pay attention. I say, oh, pay, pay attention. We need to go and look for a house. So we went to look for a house. Very difficult to look for a house. Very tiring. I, that's the job I don't want to do. Looking for a home, keep on looking. Limited money wants to buy a big home. <laughs> we got limited money wants to look at a big home, five bedrooms and so forth. Finally, the agent said, Dr. Singh, I think this home is suitable for you. But you must add on. I said, well, you must add on the price. Now. So I said, my wife said, okay, let's go and have a look. But before we look into the home, I have certain things I said to the Lord. Lord, if you bring me to that home, you must give me a, I was a little boy. I said, Lord, you must give me an electronic gate. You know, that's number one. Number two, when I walk in, I must feel the spaciousness, a big space there. So we went in, I saw everything was there. And he was asking for 540 something thousand, that's many years ago. So we decided, we said, yes, I haven't told you the story that 
the Lord told me many years ago, don't borrow. Uh, to me only, uh, but if you feel that the Lord asked you to do it, praise be to God. But he told me no borrowing. Uh, never mind, that's another story. So I said, no borrowing. So we didn't borrow. And we bought the Wilson chicken shop in Bachiang at the corner was ours. Wilson, very well known at the corner, corner lot there. That's right. When we bought it, the Lord spoke to me because I was a young Christian, just became a Christian. Bought the shop, the Lord said, I don't want you to borrow. I said, oh dear. <laughs> we, just, we just bought the... And for me to borrow is no problem because I was a dentist, my practice is good. Should I go that line? Because if I go that line, that's another <laughs> So anyway, uh, let me encourage you, when God asks you not to borrow, he will come and supply. Amen. Right? Yes. So I said, no borrowing. The first test, but I told my wife, whatever we have, I said to the Lord, Lord, sell it off. You know, sell it off. We don't want to owe anybody money. Sell it off. And that was the one that we said to God, sell off everything what we have and whatever is left, we are happy. That was the statement I made to my wife and we agreed together, we will sell it off and whatever is left, we don't want to borrow. The first one came was an income tax. <laughs> a dear friend. <laughs> income tax came and it was not a big amount. He was asking for 20000 I have to pay 20000 to income tax. There's no money. All the money tied up in a Wilson chicken shop. What to do? God said, don't borrow. I can still borrow. Because I have the capacity to borrow and I'm a, a good customer. So anyway, no borrow, we have to pray. Say, Lord, you say don't borrow. Now, 20,000 income tax, always you have to pay in time, you see. So I said, Lord, what to do? And finally, somebody came. This is God. Lad. Somebody came and saw my wife. She was a doctor in that clinic. He says, we want to buy this house, buy the Wilson shop. So my wife told me, say, somebody came, want to buy this. I said, sell, sell. <laughs> Because we already prayed to God, sell. So we, we say to God, we better do what we say to God. So they bought, somebody wants to buy that shop lot for, I think, 200000 many years ago. Lah. So the person agreed, came with $20,000 deposit. 20000 out of 200000 10%. So when the due date came, the final due date came, no, that person disappeared. Never see us anymore. He just came and put 20,000 and disappeared. Until today, we haven't seen the person. You know, so many years later, I don't know. Exactly 20,000. Came and put the deposit, and the due date came, he was not there. Until today. He has never appeared anymore. So it could be an angel, I don't know. <laughs> Gave you with that 20000 just in time for paying income tax. So praise be to God. Hallelujah. God said, just follow him. He said, he, he, he said no, I don't want you to borrow. Then we've got a very good friend, a very well-known doctor here. And uh, he passed away. And his wife is quite elderly, about 70-ish. So my wife and myself used to go and visit her, you know, bring her out to eat, you know, because she was a, he was our family doctor. Accompany her, there's nobody stay with her inside the house, so we brought her out. Few months later, she said to me, Brother Sim, any time you need $20,000, call on me, call on her lah. He said, no, I said, thank you so much. You know, very shy to borrow. <laughs> you know, he said, I said, oh, thank you so much. He said, anytime you need $20,000, call on her. So I said, okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. The next year, in the beginning of, the, 
in the beginning of next year. I think recession hits Malaysia. My brother-in-law was an architect. He did for the clinic everything, spent about $30,000 for the sister. One night, he called up the sister and said, all the project has all stopped is because of recession. So he called the sister and said, I need the 30000 back. And my wife was a woman of faith. She said, next week, we'll give you the $30,000. <laughs> there was no money in the bank. <laughs> but she got faith. She said, next week, we will give you the $30,000 to her brother. So we don't know what to do. Right? No money. Now somebody wants to have it back, the $30,000. Somebody say, you can come and take from me $20,000. Oh, dear Lord. What you want us to do? Pray, Lord. Nothing else we can do, we all just pray. Pray, pray, pray. Pray until God gave me a verse in Isaiah 64, verse 4. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. To those who love God, He has acted on your behalf. Amen. That would be how came and jumped at me and said, yeah, that doctor's wife was acting on our behalf. But I did, we were very shy to go and see her anyway. So we were still praying, praying, praying. Finally, I felt the Lord say, go and see her. Borrowing is a, never get used to borrowing. I have never sort of borrowed in the sense. So finally, my wife and myself went. As soon as we knocked at the door, of the doctor's wife, she opened her. She opened the door and said, "God has spoken to me to give." Oh no, no, not yet, not yet. <laughs> so we shared with her. I said, "So and so, because of all these things, it's thirty thousand dollars. We borrowed from the the brother has come to do everything for us for thirty thousand. He said, "No problem, Doctor Sim. Just give your brother-in-law's name." I will call my banker and telegraphic transfer to my, to my brother-in-law. I said, oh, thank you so much. And the next year, we were going to Australia. We haven't paid her yet. So we said, we have to tell her that when we go to Australia, we will send you the 30000 As we knocked at the door, she came out and said, the Lord has spoken to me to give you the $30,000. God is amazing. Yes. Say, don't borrow 20,000, the Lord supply. 30,000, the Lord supply. That's why until today, we never owe anything. You know, the house that we bought, the, the house that we bought for 547,000, we borrowed 300,000. The bankers are very nice to me. They give me 30 years to pay, probably I will be 90 years. <laughs> you know, give me 30 years to pay. But within three months, everything was settled by God. I, I want to share with you the principle here, how to pay your debts, right? When we owe that bank 300,000, right, for 30 years, God is very fascinating because he told me, don't borrow anymore, right? That was the time that I said, Lord, within one year, if we cannot pay back, we sell off this, this house also. Right? We, we will make a promise to God, we don't want to borrow. But circumstances is such that we have to buy, but then we don't have that amount. When I bought the house, I conducted the school of ministry in Australia in my place. One Australian lady came from another church to come and listen to me. And I, in the end of the meeting, I prophesied on her. After the prophecy was over, she came to me after the meeting was over. She wrote a check of 75000 I thought prophecy is not cheap, huh? <laughs> Just joking. God sent her to send me a check of 75000 for a prophecy. As soon as I receive 75000 I go into the bank to pay into what I owe immediately. Beloved, this is the key. As soon as you pay, God sends you more money. You know why? God is saying to you that you are following a principle of sowing and reaping. The Bible says don't owe anybody any money. Romans 13, right? 
So when I pay, it was like to God, I'm paying my debts. I'm not trying to borrow people's money. Paid 75,000 to it. Soon later, more money came. I paid it within three months, all paid up for 30 years. The house for that house was completely paid up by the Lord. So this is the way, beloved. As soon as you have, don't eat it up. Go in and pay your debts. You see. Settle the debts. And God sees you that, that you are doing like that. He sends you more money. So within three months, it was all paid up. Instead of 30 years. See, all the way through, when God asked us to set up a training school, the first piece of land was about three over acres. And within one month, God supplied all the money. Within all these years, we don't owe people money. And that's probably good for us so that we can travel everywhere in the world to teach, to preach and as freely as we can without having any burden. You know, I believe God knows that He doesn't want me to carry any debt burdens in my life. You know, and uh, so I want to encourage you, right? This couple was working in a bank in KL. He was a very good worker, one of the officers there. And they seconded him to Singapore to work in the same bank in Singapore. When he went to Singapore, he bought a condominium in Singapore. And he got a big bungalow in KL. So he needed to sell that to pay the condominium in Singapore. As I was praying for him over the days, in a sense that I just pray for all, all the groups that I know, Suddenly, I felt very uncomfortable with uh, so-and-so. I called him and said, are you okay? Oh, he was so happy. He said, hey, Dr. Sim, thank you so much for calling. He said, we couldn't sell off the house in Kuala Lumpur, the big bungalow we couldn't sell off. So they were getting desperate because they're asking for money for the condominium. But he got no money to pay because he couldn't sell off the house. So I suggested to him, you can hear another principle here that I want to share with you. I said to him, so and so, sow a special seed unto God for the sale of your house. I said, sow a special seed unto God for the sale of your house in KL. He heard it, he obeyed it, you know what happened about one week or so later. I can't remember the time frame now. One week or two weeks or a bit. He was so happy. He said to me, Pastor Sim, I didn't sell one home. I sold two homes. <laughs> I didn't know that you got two homes. He was telling me you got one bungalow. By sowing a special seed unto God, God sowed off the two homes together for him. We were in, my wife and myself, we were traveling to Korea, Taiwan. Is it Taiwan? With a sister for holiday. And there was a Christian driver. It's a lady driver, Taiwanese sister. She came and fetched us every day to go for a tour, sightsee. And one afternoon, they brought her to have a tea inside the tea house. My wife and her sister were sharing about giving to this taxi, I mean, this lady driver. I was sleeping, I was very tired. But my ears are open. <laughs> I was able to hear a bit about what they are talking in Mandarin, but I, I, I was tired. Finally, they shared with her about giving to God. You know, do everything towards God. It's fascinating, right? this is like that. I, at that time, I got 1,000 US in my pocket. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Chinese would say, Kepo, Kepo. <laughs> no. So I had it. So I, I took up my 1,000 US. I, I think I gave to my wife to give to her. I said, this is for her. When she received that money, she said that husband, passed away, the, the Christian driver. Husband passed away, got one son. They need a home. 
<coughs> so I said, praise God. You know, that money came probably from the Holy Spirit to, to bless her. Then they added to tell her about all the first fruits or what, you know, to share with her to give. We asked her to join us for dinner, but she always said, no, no, no. And after hearing how to give, I think, that day's collection from us, to pay her every day, we pay her a few hundred dollars, or I don't know how much. Then she decided to sow her few hundred dollars back to us, you see. We went to Korea, we went to Taiwan, now we are in Korea, six months later. She wrote to us, can you say in Mandarin, probably more effective. <laughs> What, 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 what did she say? I got a house. Eh? She bought a house six months later. God bless her a home. She was so happy. So happy. You know, and we were very happy too. You know, wanted us to pray for the new home. So these sowing seeds uh, are very special. Very special. Sometimes you're thinking, why? You need to sow. But God said, when you sow, there are special effects of reaping. I say to many people, Christian, the seeds are in your hand. It's up to you. The farmers know if they want to have a greater harvest, they sow more seeds. Or they buy more land. True? And they sow more seeds because they believe that there will be a harvest. You know? So, beloved, very important. So, give. Be generous. This is the way I, many of you will have to live. I, I, we live like that. Everywhere we go, we see people you know, come and either my wife will start to sow to the people or we sow. Because we continue to live like that. And we never lack. We don't go around asking for money. Yeah. You know, we always sow. The more you sow, the more you reap. Amen. Amen. And so that is the key in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. Go home and read all those. Not only give you more seeds to sow, he also multiply fruits for you and also reap the fruit of righteousness. So, tithing, offering are powerful. The next one I taught those people in KL, the young people, was first fruits. Give God the first and the best every year. In my ministry, since my wife passed away, we have not so a beginning of a big amount, but we still give first fruits to Israel. Every beginning of the year, we used to sow 25,000 US as our first fruit to Israel for the salvation of Israel, for the work of Israel. By this time, we have probably sold three quarters of a million US to Israel. We are not a big giant church, but we felt in God to do it all the time. We never lack. Our first and the best is number one, 25,000 US. Now, what can you do? Or what can anyone do? I got a doctor friend. The wife one day called me up in Brisbane. She's actually from Malacca. Her husband passed away. She moved into Brisbane to stay. She called me up and said, he called me Jujik. We are very good friends. He said, I'm coming to your house. I said, okay. <laughs> when she arrived into my home, she brought one tomato. She brought one chili. <laughs> you know? And in the end, she said, this is my first fruit. No, <laughs> so planted chili. The first one get ripened. So we took it out. Tomato, first one to be ripened. Took it out. It came all the way. So I joke with her, I don't mind some money, you know. <laughs> so she came all the way to practice the first fruits to me. I said, it's good. That is the way. But how can you give first fruits? First fruits has no numbers, but in Israel, when people plant by acres, it's not easy to go and tie a string down uh, one chili they plant by acres, they found that one acre out of 49 acres get ripened. Now it's a bit, a bit of every, 
accumulated together is about one acre out of 49 acres. So in Israel, what they do is they put one over 49 of your pay as first fruits. And I was, if my pay is $1,000, for example, then I give tithes, I give offering, I give first fruit is one over 49. Or 1,000 is about 10, $20 or something, or $15 or something. Some people do it every month. They are first fruits. For us, we used to give the first one down, but then along the way, we still tithe and give offering to Israel. So there are many ways there. It's up to you. But I promise you, when you give the first fruits unto God, the first and the best, God promise you, the rest of your year, the harvest is protected by God. Amen. Your pay is being protected by God. Amen. Nobody can take it away. Can you say amen? So first fruit is that reason you give God the first and the best. Yes. So that's the third way of the first fruit giving. Finally, is the feast. Feasts are very important. By the way, in Leviticus 23, the feasts are not law. A lot of churches today don't teach the feast because they think it was the law. No. In Leviticus, Leviticus 23, the Bible says the feasts are the feasts of the Lord, not the feasts of the law. So a lot of Bible school, a lot of pastors don't teach their people about the feasts of the Lord. There are seven major feasts in the Bible. You find that Jesus was celebrating the feast. Apostle Paul was going to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of Pentecost. So our New Testament saints were worshipping the feast. Let me close in four o'clock. That's good. <laughs> we can all go home and have a rest. <laughs> there are many blessings of feasts. I just want to quickly emphasize to you. There are three major feasts. Feast of Passover. That's where the Israelite came out from Egypt, where Jesus went to the cross, died, shed his blood. That was the blood that was applied onto the house. So the feast of Passover has already passed. The number feast, number two feast is the feast of Pentecost. That was in the Old Testament, the third month, where the law was given to the people in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 2, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Okay? Many of you will have. That one has passed. The third feast has not happened yet have not completely happened yet. So if you are not taught about this feast, then you, you actually, you, have not, you are not going to experience this feast. There are three events that happen in the Feast of Tabernacle, on the seventh month, the Feast of Tabernacle. Let me explain to you quickly, but it's important. In the Old Testament, the people were in a wilderness and they lived in booth, right? They lived in booth, they were able to look at the moon and uh, God was still supplying them supernaturally with water, with manna, with quills, with the, the pillar of crowd and the pillar of fire. That was in the wilderness in the past. Today in Israel, people still celebrate the Feast of Tabernacle is the autumn harvest. They collect the fruits, the harvest, which is ready for winter. Again, God provided them for winter in the time of summer, collecting the harvest. But the future has not happened yet. Jesus has not come, the second coming. Only after the second coming of Jesus Christ, then in Zechariah chapter 14, when Jesus ruled and reigned 1,000 years in Jerusalem, then he said, the nations that come and worship Jesus, that there is rain. Nations that do not come to worship Jesus, no rain. And that thing has not happened yet. No, and that's why it's so important to know the feast. And the Bible promises you, when the three feasts, Passover, Pentecost, and Feast of Tabernacle, Deuteronomy 16, verse 16, you don't go and carry empty hand. You come with an offering for the three feasts. And when you get this three feast, God promised you in Exodus 34, verse 23 to 24, no one can take your land. Amen. God will 
expand your land and no one can go and grab your land. The three feet protect you. Amen? Amen? Let me share one more part, very important part. God spoke to Moses in Numbers 29. You write down and you go home and read. You know, verse 12 to verse 35. God says to Moses, when you offer up the bulls as sacrifice, I want you to offer up 70 bulls. Why 70 bulls? Because every week they offer up a certain amount of bulls. Total 70 bulls because in Noah's time, there were 70 nations. And God wanted Moses to say to him, I want you to also... Somebody say to me, your church is a temple of the what, what nations? I think it was it, Gideon. That's from the Bible. Today, I like uh, Pastor David's church. That here we got African, we got Indian, we got yes. Yes. everywhere. Yes. That is the end purpose of the nations coming into a church. Amen. That's why in Isaiah 56 verse 7, God said, the church should be a prayer house for the nation, not just for our Malaysian. It's great Malaysians are coming. But God opens it up. That's why God told Moses, I want you to offer up 70 bulls. At that time was the nation. There were 70 nations. And then God spoke to Solomon. He says that Solomon said to God in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 32, 33. He says to God, God, when the foreigners come into the temple, they heard about your greatness of your name. God, when they pray, answer them. So that they will tell the world that you are God. Yeah. See, everywhere God reminded the people that the nations are part of what God wants them to be. That they are included in our prayer. Can you say amen? amen. Prayer for a nation is very important. I was very impressed when I came here. I saw all the nationalities here. And recently, we have in our church too, people from Nigeria, South America, they all start, start streaming in. Because when you start praying, God send in the nations. Can you see what I mean? God begins to send the nations for you to pray for them. So it's a good church. You are praying for the nation. That's the very heartbeat of God. Amen? So that is the Feast of Tabernacle. So beloved, I think I should close. <laughs> There's so, so much to share. We haven't touched a little bit of it. Uh, there are many examples and testimonies. Anyway, let me go back to the part that I started in Santa Khan. I haven't finished. Let me finish the part. So I taught them tithes, taught them offerings the first night, second night, third night. By the end of three nights, there were 200 people got saved teaching, tithes and offering, and so forth. There were de demonic cases delivered, and out of it, 200 people got saved. The first night after sharing with them with tithes and offering, I prophesied to them, the Sandakan, Batu Sapi. That's the place anybody has been to there, Batu Sapi. I prophesied. I said, this place will not be the same. After three days, I thank God I brought a doctor with me. He heard what I said. We came back to Malaysia. The Star Paper. The Star Paper wrote, as soon as we arrived into Malaysia, the Star Paper said, the government of Sabah is coming to Batu Sapi to develop the whole place. Hallelujah. God wanted them to know about tithes and offering. Not too long ago, I went to Sabah. I went back to preach in the... I asked the... Indian, he was the manager of a palm oil estate. I asked him, where is Batu Sapi today? He said, Pastor Sim, you cannot go through Sabah. We are going through the big intersection, Batu Sapi. God developed that into a big intersection in Sabah. Beloved, God's words are true. That's one thing, but more important is tithes and offerings. Through teaching of tithes and offering, God spoke a word for them because God wanted to develop the place. God wanted them to sow. You know, later when they got money, intersection, they all become to prosper. Then God wanted them to bless back God. Amen? That's why I knew that it's so important. 
tithes offering very important to God. You cannot say, I don't want to do, I got no money to do, no. When you want to do, God gives you money to do. Only when you don't want to do, then it's a different story. When you really want to honor God, God provided for you. Amen? So when God provided for you, return the tithes, sow the offerings, the first fruits, and the feast. I promise you, if you do these four areas, tithes, offering, first fruits, and feast, I promise you, you will never lack anymore. Until the coming of the Lord, God will be with you. God will supply you. Amen? Amen. Amen. And uh, I want to close. Really, it's, it's summarized for you that these four areas are important for every Christian to do. God doesn't need money. You know that. God is the one that created money for you and I to be blessed. Amen. Will you stand? Let me just pray one prayer and then we finish. Is it okay? (laughs) Father, we just thank you. Thank you for the saints. Thank you for their hunger and thirst for righteousness. Thank you that they love you. God, I pray, even as I have shared with them, Fundamentally, simply, God, open heaven for them. Provide seeds for them to sow. Provide seeds for them to sow. Provide seeds for them to sow. And Father, in the name of Jesus, as they release the seeds, cause them to supply and multiply. Cause them to reap the fruits of righteousness in their own lives, O God. Thank you for Pastor David Lai here and this church. Father, we thank you for the nations that come into this place. Lord God Almighty, we thank you and bless you that you have prospered this nation, this church, that this place is not big enough. We love you. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give God a chance. Thank you, uh, Pastor Sims, so much.